Today is the 5th of November, and for the people in this room who come from England, that's, that's a day with a particular significance. Um, it's not an official holiday or festival, but it's deeply embedded in the culture in England. But many of the people who participate don't actually know what it's about. But when I return to London this evening, unfortunately I can't be with you because we've got a university governance meeting, um, I will travel home through the countryside and I expect to see bonfires and fireworks and people standing out in the cold and the rain in front of large fires. And actually, you feel good doing that because of the warmth of the fires and the occasional meetings with your neighbours. And there are also children in the run-up to this event who produce dolls which they stuff, and they call these dolls guys, and they go around asking for money. Penny for the guy is the phrase, although nowadays they expect at least two or three pounds for the guy. So, what is the origins of this festival? Um, um, you know, what does it actually mean? Well, in fact, the origins lie in something called the gunpowder plot, discovered on the 5th of November, this day, in 1605, in other words, 407 uh, years ago, when a conspiracy was detected to blow up the king and the members of parliament through exploding a huge quantity of gunpowder which had been placed by the conspirators in a leased room underneath the parliament building. The conspiracy failed because some of the plotters had relatives amongst the members of parliament. I guess you would have guess that would have happened, wouldn't it? And so the letters about the conspiracy came to the attention of the security services. The conspirators were arrested, and I don't want to bother you with the details of their, their torture and their, their end. It was, it was grisly. Now, the leader of the plot was Guy Fawkes, and hence the term Guy for the effigies burned on the fires tonight in England. And I guess this may be where we get the phrase good guys and bad guys. And of course, if those bad guys had succeeded, this would have been an extraordinary event. In subsequent history of the world, we've yet to witness the ruler and the entire legislature disappear in the way that was planned. And you could be sure that had that happened, we'd be standing here in front of you boasting about this being a British first but uh, uh, we didn't achieve it in this particular case. But the, the theme that comes out from this for me is the theme that the Vice Chancellor has already mentioned, the challenge and distinction between continuity and disruptive change. Had this plot succeeded, we would have had no doubt uh, a great deal of disruptive change. So, thinking therefore about disruptive change, let me say a little bit about um, the transnational educational background that we see at the moment. As has been mentioned by a number of speakers, we're seeing rapid change. And this has, I think, the potential to be an excellent development from the point of view of the consumer, which I define, first of all, as the students, secondly, as the families who are paying for the students, and of course the economy and society to whom they're going to contribute eventually. But it is coming in the situation of considerable competition in which governments are looking for ways of, first of all, ensuring that higher education is cost effective, building up provision uh, to ensure their own national competitiveness, a situation in which new and modern international benchmarks are being developed for the sector. So the internationalization of higher education is leading to new providers coming into countries and providing for the local sector competition and uh, different potential standards and different potential technologies. And most countries that I visit these days have in their national strategy the desire to become a higher education hub. 
And of course, we can't all be successful higher education hubs because we can't all um, win at this game. But the ambition is very strong and very convincing to most governments. Higher, ed higher education hubs can be, and for certain countries already are, critical for national competitiveness. They attract to a country good students, some of whom stay on to contribute to the economy in which the university is based, and a favorable chain reaction can be initiated. Well-funded universities, partially well-funded because they're attracting in uh, foreign students and, and good domestic students, attract good academics. This attracts even better students. This attracts interesting research and spin-off companies. In fact, you know the story. You've heard it so many times, and as I've mentioned, everybody is trying to do it. But transnational education also poses challenges to all the players, those who are providing programs in, if you like, other people's countries, and those people who are um, providing domestically as domestic as local universities, but in competition with the foreign suppliers. Just to mention a number of these. Standards. How rigorous is the assessment that is going on in universities. How, in the case of transnational education, do we know that the standard of the award offered to the students in the uh, country where the education is being delivered, when the university is from another country, how do we know that that standard matches the standard of the degree issued in the home country at, if you like, the home campus? What is the quality of the support for student learning? This, again, an enormous challenge for regulators. They have to be open-minded about the possibilities of technical change. They have to understand that there are different learning cultures in uh, different countries in the world, but still very considerable challenges in coming up with systems for assessing quality. You can either be too relaxed and have a free-for-all and some very poor quality provision, which is often not corrected for by market mechanisms and a high level of market information because there isn't that much good information, or you can err the other way and be too rigid and prevent the development of what might be very promising uh, new university developments. And into this landscape, we have to pick up the phrase that Adrian Smith has just used, we have the potential shadow of disruptive technological advance. For me, disruptive is a word with positive and negative connotations. As I said at the beginning, good guys and bad guys. But when it comes to sectors of the economy, disruption is generally positive to the consumers and in the longer run to the economy as a whole. But disruption frequently hurts and indeed sometimes buries the existing established suppliers. It's not much fun being a legacy supplier. Often legacy suppliers in markets have high costs, fixed ideas about how services should be developed all of this held together and made difficult to change by entrenched vested interests. New suppliers into these markets emerge, low cost and agile, using new technologies and new systems. Now, almost anywhere in the world, it can be said that higher education has been one of the slowest sectors to reform. I think there's virtually no other sector in the economic and social life which has been quite so slow to reform around the world. And so I think we can argue that it has not yet gone through deeply disruptive change. But the question that we have to ask, and I certainly myself feel I sense the answer, is that disruptive change is coming. You, is coming. And I can tell you that 
none of us here at the University of London International Programmes want to be part of the legacy story. We want to be firmly part of the future. So briefly, what are our strategic themes to get us through into this future? Well, most obviously, the network represented by you here gathered today. I think the first point I'd like to make about this network is that we here today are a unique group. There's no other top-end university in the world which does what we do. This is to make a degree of high standing, degree that is academically demanding, available flexibly and inexpensively anywhere in the world. Other universities would recoil from this, other high-end universities, I would say, and say that it undermined their brand or competed with their own much more expensive on-campus programs but not the University of London. As Sir Adrian has said a few minutes ago, we've been helping individual students and helping institutions for over 150 years. And this history makes us confident that the properties of accessibility, of flexibility, and of high academic standards don't have to be in conflict. At the University of London International Programmes, we're conscious that if we didn't exist, we'd almost certainly not be invented. So we treasure our history. If we somehow stumbled and fell, I don't think we would be recreated. And we would not have this history of a top-end university operating in this extremely flexible and inexpensive manner. So you, the teaching institutions, support this learning for about two-thirds of our students, or at least two-thirds of our undergraduate body. From our point of view in the International Academy, you are absolutely invaluable. Just to mention some of the things you do, you know you do them, but I just want to mention them so that you know that I know that <laughs> we know that you do them. <laughs> um, you recruit students, you hire the best local teachers, you often provide students with social and sporting facilities, the facilities that are very important for younger people who are going through the rite of passage of 18 to, at ages of 18 to 22, when they want to be in a group going through the higher education experience. Very importantly, you liaise with governments and with national regulators, both regulators of higher education and uh, professional regulators. And it goes without saying that you understand national government priorities better than we do. So you can see that the point that I'm working up to is to acknowledge from us to you a huge debt of gratitude. And I know that many of our students, and of course they're your students and our students, so we just talk about them as the hour is very much a collective hour now, feel the same way. You provide for students a service which they couldn't obtain in most cases to afford internationally. They only, only a very small sliver of the elites of countries have the funds to uh, travel internationally and study in Europe or, or the United States or, or Australia. So in addition, you're providing often relative to what they could obtain locally a more personalized service, um, a more committed service, and one which is also flexible in the sense that it's perhaps more prepared than many suppliers would be that are within the existing public sector in um, matching the teaching around people's lives. Many of our students, your students, our students together are, are part-time students and there is a great deal of teaching I know that takes place on weekends and, and on holidays. So let me add my observations to a question a number of you have addressed which is how can we support each other better in the future? Well, 
one obvious point is this meeting and, and what comes out of it. This is the first time we've brought all of you providers together. Uh, it's the most ambitious effort we've made, and um, one of the things we want to learn from you is, should we do it again? Should we do it in a different forum? Should we do it in a different format, in a, in a different place? We want to tell you how you want, sorry, we want you to tell us how we can um, better support the students, and we want to understand from you the dynamics of the markets in, in your countries so that we can better address that supply. And we think you can discuss amongst yourselves to create interesting pathways for our students. Again, I'm talking here as joint parents. Remember, we examine in every country in the world, including in North Korea, where actually I'm afraid to say, I used to boast we had three students there. They've graduated. We don't have any students in North Korea. But the students we did have uh, went through and graduated. Uh, so we can examine in any country in the world, and that is a, a, a huge source of flexibility. So if I was dreaming up an advertising slogan for us, it would be along the lines of, while other programs are mo mobile, we're ultra-mobile. I can imagine students, and we already see a little bit of this happening, uh, in the course of their undergraduate careers, studying at three of your institutions, potentially, in different countries maybe for years, uh, sorry, one year programs in each, or sometimes just six weeks taster in another place. We had a very interesting discussion last night with some colleagues about what it would be like for students from the UK, perhaps just to slot in for six weeks in Delhi, along with one or two other uh, weeks uh, of, of other experience of India. That would be an enormously uh, enriching experience for, in this particular case, students based in the UK. And these shorter periods are cheaper to operate and they tend to be ones that the visa authorities in all countries are less worried about. So let me go on then to this theme of disruption. Most of you will be aware this year we've seen the development of something called MOOCs Massive Open Online Courses. And in fact, we had a discussion two weeks ago with uh, providers from the UK and Ireland, and one or two colleagues from that discussion are, are here today as well. And I was fascinated by the fact that I was challenged about our engagement with MOOCs. So I thought I would end by saying a little bit about that because uh, I think that will help you understand where we're going and also help us think collectively about how we respond to the challenges of technological change and indeed understand the directions from which uh, uh, technological change is, is coming at us at the moment. Now, you probably saw the announcement that we made in the press that in June 2013, five of our courses will be available on the platform of one of the two best-known MOOCs, which is called Coursera. The alternative is one from Harvard and MIT, which is called edX. But Coursera is out a, a, a platform that started uh, at, as a collaboration essentially out of Stanford University, incorporated quite quickly Princeton University, four other distinguished American universities, and then jumped the Atlantic with um, two distinguished uh, British universities getting involved. Edinburgh got in just a few weeks before us, but we're, we're the second and we're, we're very proud of it. Now, MOOCs are free courses. Why would we want to offer free courses online? Well, I'll give you a number of reasons. First of all, they attract huge numbers of students. Um, I've been going around saying that since we made the announcement, 50,000 students have pre-registered just for our courses. But I was corrected yesterday by someone who said, oh, Jonathan, 65. What is it, Andrew? 
55. Okay, so I'm exaggerating at 60. I have been known to exaggerate, but I think we can agree that 55,000 is a, not an unreasonable number to have pre-registered uh, when you're not actually launching until uh, June uh, 2013. But essentially, because these courses are very interesting, engaging, and free, we believe large numbers of students will uh, sign up, and many of them are people who will make very little commitment to them. Some of us in this room may have already signed up for a MOOC because we're interested in it and are not going to go any, any further other than just delve in and understand the pedagogy, maybe find that it's not for us. But the point is that even if only 10% of people commit to following their MOOC course right to its conclusion and undertaking whatever assessment is there, that 10% is still 10% of a large number. We think that if we get, say, 150, 200,000 by June 2013, which is not unreasonable projection given that they've got to over a million in the first few months of operating Coursera, if only 10% of those people complete our courses, and if only, let's say, 25% of that 10% then decide they're so interested that they want to register with us and take the entire course, even so, there will be a very big impact. The, the second benefit of MOOCs is that it forces us as a University of London and you as our partners to engage with new technologies. Uh, video has been around for a long time, but video is being used in a very intense way within MOOCs. So to the extent that we use video a lot, we learn how to present to video. You as teachers habituate yourselves to using video more in your teaching, either by showing short videos and discussing them or by leading students to video that they should uh, engage with as they're um, uh, studying quietly by themselves. Another critical thing is that for our undergraduate courses, not for our postgraduate courses, and this point only applies to some of our undergraduate courses, one of the things that we struggle with, given that we want to keep costs down and keep our programs relatively inexpensive, is formative assessment, is feedback. Students crave individualized information about how am I doing? Am I making the standard? Is this good enough? How can I improve? And the MOOCs are working hard on cost-effective ways of automating this. Uh, one of the ways in which this is being done is through crowdsourced formative assessment. If you, as a student, want people to comment on your work, you have to agree to comment on other people's work. And Daphne Kohler, one of the two co-founders, together with Andrew Ng, of, they're both of Stanford University, who came to spend some time with us, she is a very strong uh, supporter of automated methods of formative assessment. She says that the research that they've done at Stanford shows that on the whole the quality of the feedback is better than when it comes from a, a busy professor or busy instructor and yet it can be a lot less expensive. So you know irrespective of whether within a few years we decide that this was nonsense or this was in fact an extremely interesting development it's absolutely critical that we jump into the pool and start s swimming rather than uh, stay away from it. And the final th thought I'd like to leave you with on this particular potentially disruptive technological change is that we see you as absolutely critical partners in this. To the extent that it puts pressure on us to develop better materials and more exciting materials, we have to work with you to find out the best ways of using this material with your students. So one thing that came up from this discussion uh, 
in London a few weeks ago was a potential concern on behalf of some suppliers that this was a move to, if I can use a sort of economics phrase, disintermediate you, to somehow take you out of the picture. I want to assure you that it's the complete opposite. It's uh, about us taking the step of us as a whole community engaging with uh, what appear to be the modern directions of technological change in the enterprise in which we're involved. Finally, I'd just th like to thank you for coming to this uh, symposium. We look forward not just to the feedback you gave us at the symposium, but to all sorts of ideas that will flow in to all of us in the months ahead.